I suppose that my long association with the school entitles me to making some remarks concerning Eastman a half century ago. There were, of course, many differences because it was a different time in American society. As a reflection of uh, social norms at the time, we lived in gender-separated dormitories. This was the norm in the 1950s, not just here at Eastman, but most places as well. The Eastman dorms were about a mile away. Uh, imagine that on a cold winter day. The women were housed in three buildings on University Avenue, and the men in a building around the corner on Prince Street. Uh, that men's dorm had originally been constructed to house University of Rochester women who were attending the College for Women when it was located on what was then known as the Prince Street campus. But when the women moved out to join the men at the River Campus in 1955, the Eastman School acquired the building, which was remodeled to become the school's first real dormitory for men. Since the building actually connected with the women's dormitories, a major part of preparing it for occupancy by the Eastman male students was to completely seal off all those connecting corridors, and I mean completely. Uh, no effort was spared to absolutely ensure that life in the Eastman dorms was gender separated. Only twice a year, once a semester, were visitors of the opposite sex permitted in the residential areas. Doors to individual rooms were required to remain open during this two-hour open house on a Sunday afternoon. And security was more thorough than trying to board an international flight at Kennedy Airport. This is not to say we didn't try, by the way, but you can ask me about that at the reception, not now. <laughs> In general, there were few restrictions on the men, but the women had curfews, and they were required to sign in and sign out after 6 o'clock in the evening. The only thing the men had to endure was the presence of a house mother, a kind but elderly woman who lived in the men's residence and who was supposed to bring some kind of civilizing influence to their existence. <laughs> It was, needless to say, a thankless and hopeless job. <laughs> I couldn't help but reflect when I wrote that about the kind elderly woman, that that kind elderly woman was younger than I am now. <laughs> so, so I hope my students refer to me as a kind elderly man who taught them piano. I'm not sure, but uh, your perspective changes. You'll find that out. There was no shuttle service between the dorms and school. We walked. We walked in good weather and in torrential rainstorms and the worst of winter storms. And we all learned, as you have, that in Rochester the wind is always in your face, no matter in what direction you're walking. <laughs> On the worst of days, most of us could make it in about 15 minutes. Um, it's funny how quickly you can walk as the temperature begins to go down. You're, you accelerate a little bit more. This was, of course, a time before the internet before computers, before smartphones, cable television, and all of those intriguing gadgets that are part of your daily life. There was, for example, only one television in all four dormitories. But our social life was very active, and part of the reason was that downtown Rochester was, if you can imagine this, a very vibrant urban area and the center of retail activity, since there were no shopping malls at all at the time. In the downtown area, one could find department stores, bookshops, shoe stores, jewelry stores, and many small shops and boutiques. There were five downtown movie theaters and enough restaurants to suit anyone's culinary tastes. Concert life, then, was especially rich. This was a time when rehearsals and other major performing organizations re regularly toured, and major international artists still appeared in mid-sized cities like Rochester. During my four years as an undergraduate, Eastman Theater included appearances by the Boston Symphony, Metropolitan Opera Company, New York Philharmonic, Philadelphia Orchestra, Cleveland Orchestra, New York City Opera Company, and the Vienna Philharmonic. During the 50s and 60s, we heard recitals by such superstars as Arthur Rubenstein, Glenn Gould, Nathan Milstein, Emil Gilles, David Oistrakh, Andres Segovia, even Oscar Peterson, who needed internet and television. Daily life was not much different than now. 
We attended lessons and practiced. We played juries at the end of the year. We attended classes, did assignments, took midterms and finals, went to rehearsals, participated in concerts. The essentials of becoming a musician have not really changed that much. But what has changed in the 53 years since I graduated? The biggest change and the most obvious to me is that the level of ability, talent, and achievement of today's students is far beyond anything we witnessed in earlier times. When we old timers gather, a common thread of conversation is, thank goodness we didn't have to compete against these students when we auditioned. If you meet anyone my age who talks about the good old days, they either have a faulty memory or they're not being especially truthful. We graduated some students in my day who didn't play as well as many of our incoming students today. In fairness, I must admit that the best students from my student years were probably as good as the best students today. The difference is that there are now so many best students. There are simply more of them, and demographics may provide a part of the reason for this. The world's population has more than doubled between 1956 and 2013. With twice as many people, it stands to reason there are probably twice as many people who are seriously pursuing the study of music. More people studying means more people who play the piano well, who sing well, who play the clarinet well, and so forth. The potential applicant pool for the school is much larger. The number of young musicians who achieve a high level, all the greater. But it's more than a simple matter of having more people. Music has truly become an international language. We used to speak of Western art music, but today we can saf safely drop that word Western and just say art music. In my graduating class, we had one international student, a composer from Ecuador. There were 25 international students in the entire school, and 11 of them were from Canada. <laughs> No offense to any Canadians in the class. Huh? <laughs> and what about today? This year, we've had 216 international students at Eastman, representing 34 different countries. Just about one out of every four students at Eastman is from a country other than the United States. Therefore, it's not just population growth that affects the quantity and quality of applicants to the school, but also the fact that the school is attracting students from all over the world more people, and from increasingly diverse areas of the globe. Yet I think there's another factor contributing to the high level of musical talent and achievement we see in our students. Like all other human activities, musicians are achieving more and doing so at an earlier and earlier age. The standard just keeps rising. And if you follow videos on YouTube, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 29 years ago, a recording began to circulate in Europe and in the United States. It was from Russia. <clears throat> and it featured performances of the two Chopin piano concertos by what was claimed to be a 12-year-old boy. There was something rather unbelievable about the claim because the performances were of such a high technical and artistic level. One prominent pianist whom I know solemnly declared the recordings to be a Soviet hoax. Of course, he was a Juilliard graduate. You know? <laughs> But they were not a hoax at all. That 12-year-old was Evgeny Kissin, already well on his way to becoming one of the great pianists of our time. But Kissin's not the only precocious talent we've seen in recent years. I remember when we used to speak of child prodigies. It seems to me that prodigious achievement has become so common that the phrase is no longer needed. There are just so many young people who play so well. Midori made her debut at the New York Philharmonic at age 11. Sarah Chang performed with the same orchestra when she was eight. Sayaka Shoji won the Paganini competition in 1999 at the age of 16. A 13-year-old pianist recorded all of the Chopin Etudes in 2008, a terrific recording. Another pianist about the same age did the same thing two years later. The first of those piano prodigies subsequently recorded all the Liszt Transcendental Etudes. She was 16 and is now engaged in a process of recording all the Beethoven sonatas that will be ready for release just in time for her 20th birthday. 
How do we explain the level of students we see at Eastman? More people studying music, more people from ever increasing areas of the world, more receiving better training, and more achieving remarkable things at an earlier and earlier age. People of my generation have no cause to boast about the good old days. The good old, old days are not, the good days are now. In fairness to Matt Artizone and his remarkable staff in our admissions office, I must add that if there are more terrific students, there are also more schools who are competing for those students. Yet the quality of students that we see here at Eastman year after year is clear evidence that Matt and his people must be doing their job exceptionally well. When I completed the first volume of my history of the Eastman School, it was very easy to find an appropriate title. On so many occasions, I had looked up at the facade of the Eastman Theater and saw those words for the enrichment of community life. They were selected to describe the purpose of this theater, but in a broader sense, they describe the mission of the Eastman School of Music. What we do here is prepare our students to bring music to people in the strong belief that it has a unique ability to touch the human spirit and enrich life in our communities here in Rochester and all over the globe. Howard Hansen, who was dean, then called director of the Eastman School of Music for 40 years, always spoke of music as being the greatest of all the arts. At some level, it has the capacity to speak to almost everyone, to convey something intangible yet important, to stimulate our emotions, our passions, our enthusiasm. He spoke of music as being a great and noble art. Our task is to take that great and noble art and use it in a way that will truly enrich the communities in which we live and work. That is my hope for all of our graduates today, that you will serve the art of music and serve it well. And so I offer my congratulations to everyone receiving degrees today. You are commencing upon the next stage of your life as musicians. You are an extraordinary group. I wish you much success and happiness, but most of all, I hope that your love and enthusiasm for music will never cease to grow. Congratulations to all, and thank you. Thank you. A production of the University of Rochester. Please visit us online and subscribe to our channel for more videos.